That's one of the most important concepts for me when I think about prioritizing is that there's time and there's psych. And they aren't the same thing. You could have a lot of time, but be exhausted. The way to really see results is to show up with intention. You have these finite resources. It's not just time, it's your intention also. And so I just caution you from showing up, half-assing it, and you're not going to get the results you're looking for. All right. Tim, my dude, how's it going, man? What's up? What's up, Josh? How's it going? Well, it's Monday morning. You said you were kind of tired. I was a little tired. and I, I didn't want to mention that, but we release these podcasts on Monday morning. So I'm sure there's a lot of people, probably route setters, who, uh, you know, click play. And they go, yeah, I just was outdoors all weekend. I didn't sleep at all while I was driving back at two in the morning on Sunday. And now I'm picking up a drill and stripping. Uh, and it's okay. Sometimes, sometimes Monday mornings can be a little rough when you're getting after on the weekend. Yeah. Hey, you know what, guys, before we get into it, if you guys are working or doing your routine or something's going on, good job. Proud of you guys. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, especially you route setters. A lot of you route setters are, are listening to the podcast while you guys are doing your job, which is awesome. Uh, so just make cool shit happen today, guys, everybody. Good job. Okay, Tim, I'll, I'll take that to heart. I'm going to make some cool shit happen right now uh yeah it was cool you've been traveling a bunch and you said that you walked into uh, a gym I, I feel like we shouldn't name name well we can talk about the gym but you don't have to name names you said that you walked in and someone was listening a route star was listening to the podcast right as you walked in the door yeah we walked into a really cool gym and uh, the head route setter uh, who i know have known for a long time who may come on the podcast hey -oh. um he just turned around and he was like, had headphones in, was brushing the wall. And he was like, I'm listening to you right now. I'm listening to you guys right now. I was like, that is so cool. Like, I came here mostly to talk to you, honestly. So that was, that was so special. So shout out to that guy. Wait, Thank why you. was he brushing the wall? Go, what do you mean brushing the wall? <laughs> Dude, so like the, the nicer walls get clean nowadays. You know, not every gym cleans their walls. But he, he had like a, a drill, like a Makita drill and like a brush attachment. And it was just spinning. I didn't know this until um, my buddy Antonio, who we used to set with, uh, he pointed it out. He was like, does he have a drill attached to a brush? And I was like, oh, my God, he does. And he was just cleaning the wall. And it, was, it would look so good. Like, it looks so much better that way. Okay. I like that. That's, dude, every year we pull the climbing gym industry up another notch from just that dirty, disgusting uh, basement feeling where there's, <laughs> do you remember being in the gyms and you would see like rats run out of the wall. Do you, we had, okay, we had rat problems. I shouldn't say I this. never saw a rat. I should edit this out. I'm totally not going to edit this out. Anyways, there's a gym that will not uh, be named that had huge rat problems. You'd just be sitting there a setting and you'd see a little rat run out, like all full of foam Holy in cow. its mouth, making some. Anyways, good job Whoa. cleaning the walls, putting good holds in the walls. We love you guys. Uh, route setters are the unsung heroes. I mean, we talked about in the Nathaniel podcast where, the route setters make the freaking climbs that they compete on. They, they're really, you guys are the, you guys and girls are the ones who are really letting us do what we love when it's indoor climbing. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. All right, Tim. Uh, you've been traveling. I've not been traveling. I'm, I'm staying at home. Uh, and I actually think that's going to be kind of part of our topic today. We're going to talk about prioritizing and how to, how to fit it all in when you got a busy life. And it's interesting because I sit at home and have a more rigorous or not rigorous, rigid schedule than you do. I've got kids. I've got, I don't know. I've got other things too, I swear. Uh, and you travel a lot. And it's, it's funny because I know that you're young and you maybe don't seem like you have as much responsibilities, but I talk to you all the time and it's just boom, 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 you know, sponsorships, coaching, travel, I mean, you know, you got all those things that you got to do to pay your bills too. I'm really curious to see how we come at it from our different angles. But that's a side note. What I've been doing is I've been hanging out and I've been, I've been hangboarding a lot, man. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm still rehabbing my shoulder and I've never really put this much effort into hangboarding. And the few things that blew me away is that it's clear how much volume we put on our fingers when climbing to me now, because I'm hangboarding. 
and I'm not tired. My, my hangboarding doesn't feel tweaky. I don't hate it. I come in, my fingers feel fresh and I have these good, I mean, they're like sessions, right? I'm, I'm maxing out, I'm trying hard and lo and behold, hangboarding works. I've been grabbing onto small grips and I've been getting better at grabbing onto small grips. Uh, how that translates to my year, you know, my season coming up, I don't know, but yeah, uh, way to go hangboarding. Uh, Newsflash, PSA. Said a, <laughs> it works. Uh, you, you said a couple of interesting things there, and I think here's going to be a great, you know, I, I think that already is going to help so many people just thinking about why hangboarding may, may work or may, you know, not work for, for them. And, you know, one really interesting thing that you're saying is that you've been climbing less in general, which is kind of what got you into hangboarding. And that's kind of part of your rehab and whatnot. But that alone allows you to hangboard more, right? Like hangboarding will substitute certain things. So you know, you're realizing how much climbing volume that we actually have. You know, another thing that's really interesting that I've found from hangboarding myself, which I've probably only done like realistically, three real stints of hangboarding my entire climbing life. In 11 years, I've probably done like three cycles of hangboarding where I've done it consistently for maybe more than a couple of weeks. That was what I would count like as an actual cycle of hangboarding. And um, the big thing that I noticed was, you know, how much impact my, cli my climbing actually gives my fingers. Uh, and I guess, yeah, how much you should and should not be able to do a lot of the time and how, how consistently you can kind of load your fingers without, you know, really getting them hurt. And that just feels better. But that consistency is scary. It also was kind of crazy to me how much my fingers were getting stronger and maintaining themselves without something like hangboard. That was something really interesting to me too, where I was like, well, I could never hangboard, you know, for literally the rest of my life for climbing, but should I do that? Like, no, I, I you know, one thing I'm learning from just hearing you talk about it and kind of going back into my hangboarding was hangboarding was really healthy. I should make room for it, but I should take into account what that does to my climbing as well. There's just a couple of notes there, like, I guess, how much have you been climbing the last uh, couple of weeks? Basically none. Uh, not so much because of my shoulder, just because of life and I'm building a new wall. And as a result, my moon board has plywood and boards underneath it. So my hangboard is very open. But I want us to be careful where we just, we just had a podcast about how you don't want to focus on strength training. And, you know, what we do here is tease out these nuances. Sometimes we have, attention grabbing headlines or things that are counterintuitive, you know, and I don't know, I don't want people to get sucked into that, that clickbait BS. We're, we're all about the nuance. I mean, that's what really it takes to do high level is it's not black and white. It's all about the fundamentals. Like just, just go climbing. You never have to train ever. It's no, it's not like that. When we say that we've never hang or that we don't hangboard much in when I know you've hangboarded and I really have hangboarded, but it was just, hard for me to recognize the benefits to really doing a lot of hangboarding when my climbing was progressing from going outside, from climbing. And so, uh, again, I, I just, I want to add the, this nuance here and it's, it's going to come into a, our topic later today too, because when it comes to prioritizing, you have to do the thing that you want to get better at. And yeah, that's our consistent theme. But then if you're going to do training and oftentimes we have these gaps in our, in our ability, you have to be very, very laser focused and very precise in what you need, what gaps you need to fill. Cause if we know that our North star is to get better at climbing and it's like, I want to get better at climbing on vertical granite. Okay. We'll climb on vertical granite. Right. But then if I really know through through time, through effort, that micro holds are a very big issue for me. Well, then if you saw my hangboard routine, and, and this is, it, it is an issue for me, are micro holds. That's what I do on the hangboard. I do not do two finger pockets. I do not do slopers. And I'm not saying that those are bad grips. I'm saying what I am doing is hanging on the smallest crimps I can, and I build up and I go to the next smallest crimp. So it's yeah, it just translates exactly to what you need specifically. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I, I'm always, you know, that's always the question. <laughs> yeah, maybe I was talking to a buddy of mine uh, at a birthday party this weekend, and he was saying how his hangboard numbers, he really focused on it a few years ago, his hangboard numbers shot through the roof, a, you know, something like 35% more weight on everything. Yeah, just every, every metric shot through the roof. He said, yeah, it had no effect on his climbing. And yeah, yeah. I, 
dude, that's great. Yeah. Th that's something crazy too. I've, I've found in hangboarding was that, uh, maybe there's a science scientific study on this, but I find that consistent hangboarding, regardless of the load is much more effective for me than increasing my load in hangboarding. I don't know if you notice the same thing, just the fact that I'm doing it over and over again for a couple of days and not missing a day and not changing the load of it is actually a lot better for me. It's like doing pushups. Like if I've done a, you know, if I'm haven't worked out in a long time, but I just do a week straight of like 20 pushups when I wake up every day, I feel so much better the week after that. You know, just, just doing something consistently, having that blood flow, having that movement in my fingers and whatnot. Well, it, you know, just it begs a few questions there when I hear someone say they got better at hangboarding, but their climbing didn't get better. And this guy has great technique. This guy has been climbing for, mm, gosh, interesting. he may have been climbing for longer than me. He's, he's an OG. Uh, and so you ask yourself, is it because his volume of climbing went down in order to make room for that mm. uh, finger training and it didn't translate as in the time he spent doing something else was not as valuable as the time he spent climbing. And that, that's a question mark. I, I, I don't know. And then the other question is, were fingers his, his weak point in his climb? You go, I, I don't know. Uh, and, then, no idea. and then what's interesting, he was talking about, there, there's some different studies around contact strength versus hypertrophy in the forms. There, there's just, there's, there's been some, I, I won't name names, but actually, and you probably don't know about this, but in the recent past, there's been some arguments around the goal of finger training and um, hypertrophy around finger training. And it, it makes people wonder, oh, you know, is, is this actually, does finger training actually, th does hangboard training itself actually allow you to crimp harder on climbs or dead point to climbs to thing, dead point to holds better. And, you know, that's a, that's a question mark too, of was he getting better at the type of finger strength that he needed in order to excel on climbs. And I mean, I have my thoughts on it that I, I, mm. I shared with him, but it's, <laughs> it's just interesting. Like there's so many variables. And this yeah. is why I, I say I'm getting better on micros. And I do believe it will help me, especially with some of my Bishop goals, but I'm curious. We'll see. Yeah. I'm really interested to try to tackle this. Uh, we're not like researched enough to really go deep into all the variables here, but I'm really interested to break this down and talk about it another time. But I do love what you said. Um, and we can kind of close this here, but <laughs> like I used to um, be, you said another time. Thanks for, okay. I'll, cl I'll shut this <laughs> yeah. door. I'm sorry. To, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think it's the, the real thing that you're bringing up is that you've been hangboarding a lot and hangboarding a lot is great for you, but there's, you know, a reason why you brought up the other podcast that we just did about your training wrong and the, the your training wrong podcast. Yeah. That's a total clickbait type of thing, but we're calling a lot of people out. You know, I made a lot of heavy accusations there that, you, you know, people in general, myself included for a long time, it's actually maybe something that I prided myself on for a really long time was making sure that every single day I did have the right North Star. And it kind of did amount to, I felt like I was getting better at climbing every single year of my life. And yeah, there were certain strengths and weaknesses that I could test metrically that were up and down by dramatic amounts. But my climbing was always getting better every, every year in, in a way that I also would be able to see in most performance areas that I would try, like a competition, like a project time outside, like a session in the gym, trying to flash a bunch of climbs. Like these are the three places that I always try to perform in. And I was always getting better at those types of places. So, you know, that's an interesting thought that we, we had with that podcast, but hangboarding, man, so interesting for you to say that you just didn't see the benefits of it before because you weren't doing it as much. And now you just see the benefits of it. But what are the benefits? I think personally, like when I was hangboarding, my fingers just felt better. Like the main reason why I can't do climbing movements a lot of the time is because the hole doesn't feel good enough to do X, Y, and Z, you know, A, B, C, D, E, like whatever I want to do. But, but my fingers are usually the limiting factor. If that is you, you may see hangboarding. You may see gains from hangboarding if that is you. But that's a big if. And that's what Josh is saying with be really specific about your low hanging fruits. Be really specific and aware of the things that the reasons why you cannot do climbing movements or the way that you even approach climbing movements. And if you are one person where you're like, ah, I don't know, my fingers don't feel very good when I'm doing this or I'm sticking this and my fingers literally like peel off or I'm sticking another hold and my lower hand peels off because the finger, you know, it's just too much. And that's the thing is like, Josh, you're a climber who's really good at using his feet. You're a climber who's really good at tossing his body in specific places. There are so many factors of climbing movement of getting to a place or holding a position that you do not struggle with. So the limiting factor is going to be your fingers, where I think a lot of people's limiting factors maybe aren't their fingers. Yeah, I, that really resonates with me where you say, 
if the hold doesn't feel good, it, that that's me. It, you know, I it, I'm just gonna yeah. do some really broad brushstrokes. There's people who, whenever they get a hold, they feel good, but they have trouble getting between that hold and the next hold. And there's people who have no trouble getting between holds, but they can't hang on to the holds. And that's that's me, just as a very broad brushstrokes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I to to take it back to that guy I was saying who had extremely good gains in his hangboarding but uh, didn't see any success in his climbing he's one of those people who when he gets a hold he has great technique he understands how to crimp down get up on that foot lock off and then reach but it's that it's that distance that he has trouble with and when we went into these ideas around well what about dead pointing to a hold and how does figure training uh, matter there and I've always been really good on bigger rungs on dead pointing it's that it's that grabbing that micro edge, pulling it down, and just locking your body in that I, I've I've struggled with, and so I'm hoping that hangboarding seems to mimic that more. Where perhaps my my buddy will have seen more gains from campusing. I, I it's yeah. it, it's tough to know. Um, okay, I the 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 last oh I actually one thing I wanted to address that you brought up is this idea of me not doing hangboarding in the past and. You know, I've seen games from doing things outside of it. And it's just this, it was just the basic thing that I'd show up in the gym, we'd be on the spray wall or we'd go outdoors and we would set made up problems on tiny little holds. And, and I still think that was preferable to understanding how to crimp hard, understanding how to use my body to maximize whatever uh, you know, small hold I, I did have. And it's really tough to climb on micros all day, you know, climb on micros all day, and then go to the hangboard and just say, I'm just going to beat the crap out of my fingers. That, that's just, that, that's not, you can't do it all. More is not always the answer. Uh, and yeah, so uh, just wanted to answer that. And then the last thing I got to tell you, because it was just such a trip for me. So I was talking to our buddy, uh, Dan Bell, uh, and Dan is known for being an absolute beast on small crimps uh he wouldn't tell you he you know Dan, dan's not the kind of guy to to brag uh and so i don't i won't say any numbers or anything but he sent me some videos that blew me away uh that what he was doing so it made me ask him i said dan i don't want to get sucked into the trap of training fingers you know i don't want to just go down this rabbit hole because it is enticing to uh, to see gains and it feels good and you want to keep on going and i asked him for some kind of metrics like where what should i aim towards so that i know that i'll have kind of checked the box so at the very least i'll be competent for the kind of things that i want to climb and he basically i'm gonna put words in his mouth he didn't say this exactly but he basically argued that you want to own the six mils you want to be able to really feel comfortable on six mils you know he didn't say that means 10 second hang he didn't care about the grip so much which i thought was interesting uh you know whether it's with a thumb, without a thumb, you know, using the side, uh, he he thought that the four mils were perhaps he can he can do the four mils uh, and do them well, but he thought perhaps they they weren't worth the effort that they took to get there. As far as my personal goals, uh, and I just thought that was good to put it out there, where it's nice to have a little bit of a well, if you're struggling on twelves, uh, maybe you should put some time in the hangboard. Doesn't mean it's everything for you, but. You know, there's a hint. Um, I did have to kind of double on that. I love that question that you're asking, Dan. Like, you know, as someone who is probably one of the top couple of people in the world when it comes to asking about finger training or like talking about finger training, Dan has to be one of the experts there. And I, I was just like, listen, I was like, what, what did he say when you asked him that question? It's like, that makes a ton of sense, dude. Six mil does translate the most in your level, you know, in like your level and above, I think that's where it matters. I tend to have people own 20 mil, own 15 mil, like own that grip range is you're going to see way, way more like uh, you're going to see way more gains in different styles of climbing, probably way more frequently than six mil. But I have noticed that I have been able to grab the six mil a lot more recently in the last couple of years of my climbing. And that has seen in insane gains in a lot of my climbing. So I'm definitely going to start trying to own that six mil. And the way that you own it, I like how you're saying the, the type of grip necessarily doesn't probably matter as much. The way that I've always approached finger training, though, is I kind of, 
uh, maybe after year six or so, I started to pay more attention to evening out my three finger drag, my half crimp and my full crimp, evening those out. I also noticed that my uh, half crimp is probably the most scalable. It's, it's easiest to gain strength in and to gain way more strength in than the other two variations. But uh, that's one thing that I'm going to be fo focusing on is can I three finger drag a six mil? Can I full crimp a six mil? Can I half Ooh, crimp a six mil? Three finger drag Ooh, a three six finger mil. Drag of mm. roads. I'm not even <laughs> sure. I did. Yeah. Uh, Bet you Colin Duffy could do it easily. Yeah. Um, it, I, I was talking to Dan and, and if anyone's listening is really into finger morphology, I, I'd love to, we, I'd love to talk to you. We'd love to bring you on the podcast. It's, it's. It's an area, the reason why I was thinking about that, Tim, is this idea of what you prefer and what's more scalable, whether it's a full crimp, a three finger drag, a half crimp. And, and there's been some cool stuff out of Aiden Roberts and the Beastmaker guys about some, just hearing about the different kinds of grips depending on your finger length and everything. And it's funny because we can talk about ape index all day and the, the pros and cons about having really long arms or, or short arms. And clearly we grok that how your limbs are in comparison to your height are important when we're talking about doing movement of finger morphology, you know, the different lengths of your finger and maybe even the size of your fingers compared to your palm or the thickness of your fingers. We really have no idea what's going on there. There, There's some talk around there, but someday people are going to really understand that and they're going to look at your hand and say, you need to train the back three because X, Y, Z, and you're always going to feel better on full crimps or, or wherever the, the case may be. And I, I'm looking forward to that. My last intro uh, for our podcast, we just went, we already like covered some of the stuff we're going to cover at the end too, but that's okay. I just got, I got to correct myself again, Tim. Uh, this is embarrassing. I said on a podcast a while ago that Roses and Blue Jays may have been FA'd by Joe Kinder. It was clearly not. So of course, I came back on to correct myself that the FA was done by Evan Race, and it's not. It's it's not it's not either of those guys. And uh, thank you to uh, our good buddy uh, Bryce Viola um, out of the Northeast, uh, who let me know that I was ex extremely wrong twice in a row about who FA'd the classic Great Barrington Test piece, Roses and Blue Jays V13. Of course, it was Dave Graham. Of course, every if you if you don't oh. know what boulder or who did the boulder, it's probably Dave Graham. Okay, that's that's the lesson to be learned <laughs> there. Yeah, I did a lesson that I learned was Bryce Viola should come on the podcast because he's he's the encyclopedia. Sounds like we can do that, dude. Did you see he was on a pod? He was on the Nugget with the the whole what? Northeast crew. I haven't listened to it yet. Sorry, Bryce, I haven't oh. listened to it yet. But they were all on there. Uh, Bryce's incredibly accomplished climber and for some reason it does seem like the northeast doesn't quite get the it just doesn't get the publicity even though let me tell you they're climbing hard over there yeah i mean i think it, it's it's more fair to say that mainstream boulders that make it are like probably not over there maybe there's a couple but it's so much easier to get famous from climbing stuff in tahoe or yosemite right like <laughs> but those guys are extremely strong i've yeah i've climbed with bryce a, a fair bit in the past and it's been a while, but he he was always super super impressive to watch climbing. So, yeah, it's calling you out. Let's go <laughs> talk about finger morphology. That guy has just these big freaking hands. He's just a he's just I don't yeah. know if he's big or small. He's just like a normal sized guy, just giant hands. And let me tell you, that guy can crimp. He did buttermilker uh, using that foot crimp. Uh, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Man, we're just deep in the weeds here, but. Uh, you, you know that you, you know that kind of ear that you could maybe gas yeah, yeah, yeah. He used that instead of the slope. Instead of the dimple? Are you kidding? Yeah. Me? Anyone who goes what? watch those videos, uh, you won't even know what we're Holy. talking about because it's just some. It's not like a terrible crimp, but it's definitely not a great crimp. And yeah, that's the way Bryce chose to do it. And I again, I love seeing people. That's that good to great mentality that Bryce found his way. Yeah, you know, I'm sure he probably could have done it the other way, but that was. That was the way he chose to to send that boulder amongst many other hard boulders. So, yeah, thanks, Bryce. Wait, what? Go ahead. Way too nerdy, but I think in dosage, uh, Dave Graham, he does like the double bump left-handed. So he still grabs the dimple, does the bicycle, goes left, left, and then he comes right hand into that gas stone to release the toe hook to then jump. So it's only been used, I think, as far as videos that I've seen by probably Bryce or Dave Graham, but in totally different ways. So that's pretty awesome, dude. Damn, Tim, I can't believe you know that. That is that is nerdy as can be. That's a good thing you have a podcast to get nerdy on. Um, 
okay, Tim, let's let's uh let's change gears. Um let's do a reflection on the last podcast we did, Mr. Nathaniel Coleman. Uh dude, that was a good one, Tim. I'm I'm still just feeling really good about it. I'm so happy we got to put that out there. It's it was really special. And also you have these moments when you're podcasting where you just kind of click with someone. You just you just feel I mean, it's like when you're at a party. Uh, and you meet someone or you, you're with your buddy and you just have those moments where you just are right there. Both people are right there. All three of us are right there. Just having one of those conversations that really make the night special. So we got to do that. But we got to do that with Nathaniel Coleman, who has wisdom and knowledge uh, from <laughs> yeah, 15 years of competing at the highest level. And I just thought it was a really special thing to have that intersection of we had a really good podcast. It just kind of flowed and it went well, but then we had it with Nathaniel Coleman. And I also think that he came out in a way where the information he brought and the depth he brought uh, to the questions we asked was, was special. It was different. It was, it was the Nathaniel that his friends know, it, you know, I got so many messages you know, before the podcast, I reach out to, you know, mutual friends and everyone just said, Nathaniel's amazing. Nathaniel knows so much about this. Nathaniel is great. I can't wait to hear it. But just because someone has that depth of knowledge doesn't mean it always comes out when we do a two hour podcast. It's just, it's not that easy to make those special moments. And I thought Nathaniel freaking delivered. And so thank you to Nathaniel. Thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm going to remember that one for a long time. Yeah, I think that was super well said. I, I, I don't have too much to add to that, to be honest. Um, if you guys are somehow, you know, 30 minutes deep into this podcast and haven't listened to that one, you guys got to go and, you know, we'll finish this podcast. It's course, better but, than you know, us. Look, it's better. <laughs> wait, like I've said this maybe four or five times already, but that was hands down my favorite episode that we have done. It was my favorite episode to record, but it was also my favorite episode just to like listen to what he was saying. And, you know, I don't get a lot of new information in climbing very often. You know, I don't I don't get people coming up to me and being like, oh, I found something new now tim like here's here's something and that was so awesome for nathaniel just to go deep with us because it felt like that what you're talking about where like he was finding things to talk about as we were talking about it, which is kind of how these podcasts happen and how the conversations happen uh so thanks nathaniel uh for for sharing and it seemed like i mean he, he just uh posted a, <laughs> a climbing video of himself um well not just for you guys listening but uh when right after we did the podcast he kind of posted a video of him climbing and you know he kind of was sharing that some inner thoughts came out even then. And it's like, oh, dude, I can't imagine, you know, how many times I've done a podcast and gone to a climbing session and my climbing session was better because of the podcast. Oh, it's so good just to be able to talk and like really think climbing through because we're just doing all the time. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing. And, you know, a lot of my climbing came from thinking, but to be honest, a lot of my thinking has been missing. Uh, and so, yeah, that was that was a really cool reminder as well for him. Just like yeah, I've thought about it a lot. It's cool. Well, that episode or the that Instagram that he posted. I don't know if you uh, know this, Tim, but I had sent Nathaniel that that was a clip from the cold opening. So that was what I chose as we call it the cold opening. You know, the little clip at the beginning. And I just when when he said it, it just blew my mind and blew. I think it blew your mind. I, I want to say that we. It may have been that one where we interrupted him and you said something like, get that tattooed on yourself, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, it stood out for you so much. And I, yeah, I, I, I want to repeat that because it just really got me. I, I don't know why it just encapsulated something really special to me where I had asked him about what he thinks about when he's on, on the mat, when he falls, when, when you're climbing, you're, you have that really intense pressure. You got a clock on you. This is more for competitors, but honestly, if you can't translate this into every other form of your climbing, then you're not trying hard enough. And I said, Nathaniel, what's your, what's your self-talk when you fall off a boulder and uh, just what goes through your head? H how do you decide what to do next? And what came out of it was that there wasn't really self-talk. He wasn't saying to himself, no, it's okay, Nathaniel, you got this dude. Like you're, you're Nathaniel Coleman. There, there was none of this hype. There was none of this negative talk either. There was just the getting in touch with your body and the flow and trying to understand what went wrong and how your body felt 
so that he could get back on the wall and hear, I don't know, I don't know if hear is the right word, feel his body and what it was telling him. And it just really blew me away because it's so tempting when we think about mental game to think that it's some words that you say to yourself or some kind of mantra. And for some people it may be, but what he said and how he approached, let's be honest, failure. I mean, he, he fell, but he said, don't take it personally. Don't get frustrated by it because all of that just gets in the way of you understanding what went wrong, how your body felt when you fell. You know, were you on the heel hook too much? Did you not toe hook or do you not, do you need to smear? And just that taking away that, that useless layer and just connecting your body and thoughts and feelings to your next action was beautiful. And I, I'm glad I, I'm glad he felt it as, uh, as deeply as I did when I heard it. Yeah. I love, I love the objective awareness, right? Like that's all he's talking about. It's just like, just be aware, you know, like he's not saying that he doesn't encounter emotion of course emotion comes but it's he's he's kind of realizing that emotion it just gets in the way of having that awareness and you know what was interesting was it didn't necessarily blow my mind in a way where i hadn't heard this information before like i coach it regularly you know i've, I've said those exact type of ideas to people i've said those exact type of ideas to myself i'm not a civil, silver medal olympic you know uh medalist i'm not a not yet dog I'm, i haven't won nationals not yet I haven't won nationals, you know, I haven't flashed every boulder in finals or anything like that, but I've tried really hard to emulate the mindset that Nathaniel tries to do or has done in those, in those moments. And, you know, for whatever reason, I had never really competed that well, but I've had moments where I have competed really well. And that's the only time it's happened is when I actually can do those things. And that's why it kind of blew my mind then, because I was like, to hear someone like that say it, and it was really in line with a lot of things that I try to do not super successfully, but try to do, I was like, that's so cool. Like, it's so cool just to hear him. It also felt for him like it was like blew his mind as he was saying it, where he was like, ah, like I didn't realize that that's the, these are the things that I do. So it was cool. Everything was raw. Everything was like probably the most authentic thoughts you can hear from him about those scenarios. Maybe it seems like he hadn't really talked about those things before. So uh, really, really special episode, really special conversation. Uh, it, it's out there for you guys. Go listen. Yeah, the the whole part where he was willing to share with us how he's not competing at the next Olympics. And he said, you know, he wasn't even sure if he had shared it publicly. And the whole thing behind that and just leaning into, what do you call it, the, the power of psych. Uh, and just seeing that behind the scenes and understanding that a lot of his quote unquote superpower came from his excitement of the thing he was doing. And, and I think that's always a, a good hint too when you think about your climbing. If you're trying to do your first V11 and it's this low ball choss pile that honestly you don't like, that you really don't want to be there and you just want to tell people that you did, you know, whatever grade it is that you did, you're just not going to find the best out of yourself. And I, I think that's, I think we talked about maybe in, one pot maybe it was called maximize or some dealing with constraints. And it was just about finding what you love and then really committing to it. And you learn a lot of lessons from the thing that you love. And so, you know, if, if Nathaniel chooses to do competition anymore, uh, because he doesn't feel that same love for it they did before, I guarantee you that the love that he had for competition and the lessons that he learned from there will just translate into whatever next chapter he has. And I just, I just applaud him for, for being willing to recognize one of the things that makes him so special and then lean into it. Hell yeah. Well, if you guys have cool things that you like from that podcast, let us know. I'm always interested to hear. I actually do get a lot of messages about people from previous podcasts. So thank you guys for doing that. But also let us know what you think about that podcast. I'll tell you what I thought, Tim. A freaking banger. Um, go listen to it. Uh, follow him on Twitch too. I think that was a really cool little thing that came out where you know, Nathaniel's also experimenting with streaming, which is, you know, me and Tim have talked about it. It's it's hard to, for us to do it all, but I think that's a really cool medium. And uh, I mean, in what other sport would you get to watch someone like Nathaniel Coleman, Olympic silver medalist, having a session and you can text with him you or, you know, you can chat with him. Uh, he's doing sessions over at Pusher with uh, a bunch of other superstar athletes. And yeah, so 
I'll, I'll leave uh, I'll leave the link to his Twitch again in in the show notes here if you don't find them in the uh, previous podcast. But yeah, go check out uh, Nathaniel Coleman live on Twitch and just yeah, thanks again, Nathaniel. That was special. Okay, Tim. New section announcements. Well, it's a it's not a new section. It's the same section also. This announcement. Often our announcements are about something going on in test piece, like there's a new classroom coming up, uh, something special like that. I just wanted to to point out that Katie Lamb did box therapy. If you don't know that thing, you probably haven't been on the internet. Holy uh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Katie Lamb uh, did the first female scent of any V16. And this one, box therapy, just an absolutely beautiful block in Colorado. F8 by Daniel Woods, or the sit, I think Tommy Caldwell did the stand. It's just out in the middle of nowhere. It's like a four-mile hike. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not going to say a whole bunch about it. I'm just, I, I know Katie. She's fantastic. She's not just, she's way more than even just her amazingly hard climbing, but uh, just really impressed and and just shout out to her for, for making history. Yeah, dude. Um, I don't want to go too deep into, you know, Katie and box therapy and V16 necessarily. But one thing that has been coming up in discussion, I feel more lately in general, but uh, in my discussions is like the disparity between male and female climbers. And my answer has always been, I think it just happens to be that men are ahead in this game, but there's no way in my brain that I think that climbing is a male dominant sport. I think I've always thought that female climbers have just as capability of getting strong in you know, in any capacity and climbing, you know, if you think that climbing is a male dominant sport, you know, jack shit about climbing, you know, nothing about climbing. Climbing is a technical sport. There is so much going on. There's so many mental things that go on in climbing and, uh, yeah, girls do really, really well. And, uh, yeah, do, I think, I think Yanya or Katie or someone can break the new grade, I think in either sport or bouldering. And I can't wait for that to happen. So that was a great, cool Cool stepping stone into that. Well, I think what you're highlighting here is what we were talking about in the last podcast that it was that was just you and me. Is that it's not about training. <laughs> like it's not about uh, you know maybe if 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 climbing came down to deadlifting, then it is going to be a male dominated sport because you know if you look at the numbers for deadlifting, it's going to be higher for for men than women. But this is what's so interesting about climbing is. Every climb is different. Every body is different. Every choice up the wall is your own choice. And so, you know, you see kids climbing uh, V, V hard, V 50 or something, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, I, I like what you're saying. I think it really highlights how amazing our sport, our sport is and how complex it is. And yeah, so good job, Katie. Um, our other announcements are, dude, I just, I just looked on the Test Piece podcast on Apple Podcasts, and I noticed that we don't have nearly as many reviews as on Spotify. And so I'm just asking everyone listening, if you like what we're doing, please go on to Apple Podcasts and leave a, a, a five-star review. Well, you can, you can leave whatever review you want, but please five stars. Uh, and if you do uh, go and do that and you leave a written review, then we're going to say thank you by inviting you to our next classroom. This one will be in October me and Tim haven't set the date yet. Uh, so email us if you do leave a review at hi at Test Piece Climbing and let us know your, uh, your username and what you wrote so we know it's actually you. And yeah, that next classroom, um, we may have someone special joining us. I, we're not 100% certain yet because it's still a ways away, but uh, it would be one that you would want to join. So thanks so much uh, for listening. And yeah, please go leave us a review. And that's it for announcements unless you got one, Tim. Wait, who's the guest? I want to know. Tim, I want to say I, it just in case. I think you might. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You might know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Tim, don't no don't, don't ruin it. Yeah. All right. Um, let's uh, let's let's give our pro tips, man. I was just gonna go right into the topic, but my pro tip has literally nothing to do with the topic, so <laughs> I'm just gonna give it really quick. Me neither. Oh man. Okay. Well, that's good then. That's good because they'll make a very clean break. Um. My pro tip is uh, when you're projecting a sport route, practice the rest. Like go to that rest, play around with your foot positions, your hand positions. Uh, rests have beta. And I, I got this when I was watching my buddy Sander on a steep climb named Desire. And he was just doing a 
you know, a, a working burn, not, not a red point burn. And he was playing around at the rest. And I, I mean, this is in some ways it's obvious, but especially as the grades get harder, those rests are not quite, they're not a, a no hands rest that you're just hanging out at feeling good. Uh, they can be strange and awkward and you just have to really suss out every little micro beta to, to get back as much as you can. And one other insight into this is that I think people don't realize how unfun resting can be in the sense that it can be literally painful. You, they, they, can be, they can be ugly. You have to wedge yourself into this little kind of hole and push your shoulder up against the wall and your face is, you know, you're breathing dirt. You're just, you're really uncomfortable in a way. Or I often will find like it's a crack and you're reaching your hand way back and you're trying to literally have the wall dig into your, your forearm or something to take as much weight off of your fingertips as possible. It's you know, painful, like leaves, leaves a, a mark. And I just don't want people to think that all rests are fun and nice and uh, you know, it can be awkward and weird, but just commit to that. And by the way, no one on the ground will notice that you're in a really awkward position. No one can tell, you know, it doesn't have to be pretty. And honestly, it often isn't pretty to get the most out of it. I can tell, I can watch and I can tell if you're resting or not. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I've got two notes. Uh, that's a fantastic pro tip. I think people definitely have a misunderstanding of what rest actually is and how to practice it. And man, I, I think I pulled on a bad girls club over over four trips, over four years, I think I pulled onto it maybe in like the 60 to 80 time range. I also fell on the last draw 15 times from the bottom. And so there's three real big rests on Bad Girls Club. Uh, one's a massive jug rest uh, right after the beginning boulder cruxes. And then one's a really uncomfortable like three finger drag rest with these like weird double knee bars. And the last one's a really bad rest with a really, really hard knee bar. It's super, super active super super active rest but you only have i think 12 moves after that to the top so really what you're resting is something very specific i love what you're saying about um two things i want to add on to that is uh that you kind of already said but rest takes sacrifice rest takes a lot of sacrifice right and just understanding what you're sacrificing in order to get something else is a really important thought process to have in your rest that'll help you sequence your rest it'll help you practice your rest because if you're just resting for the sake of a feeling then, but there's no North Star for like what the rest is actually getting you. If you just want to feel better on the rest, you're probably not going to rest. You're probably going to leave the rest before you actually want to. Uh, and then you're just not looking for anything specific and you're not going to tweak your body to a place where I love what you're saying, like turn your shoulder into this way, like get lower into your feet, like, you know, turn your hips one way because that's really how you find rest because you start, you start to learn like what you are actually sacrificing. If you're going to sacrifice the next 20 moves and that's all going to be half crimping and like, you know, big dead point movements, don't hang in a half crimp period. Like, don't do that. That's, that's going to be the exact thing you're sacrificing for the movements that you're doing afterwards. So sacrifice something completely different. And if you cannot, maybe it's not a good rest. Maybe the rest is better locked off in the next movements on a three finger drag while you're shaking up for 10 seconds on one hand. Maybe that's a better rest than a 45 second rest that you're doing somewhere. I knew pretty much exactly how much time I was resting, by the way, in each of my three rests on Bad Girls Club 2. Over time, I realized like, oh, well, 45 seconds in this position only gets me more tired, you know? 25 seconds isn't enough for my heart rate to slow down. And I'm just a little bit too excited for the next position. I just fumble. You know, there's, there's so many little things you're going to learn from that. And the, the, the second thing I wanted to say was people probably don't know, and just check this yourself, you probably don't know how much you can relax in a position. Even in the most standard position in a jug hang, try to relax more and more. This is something we practice as team kids. And I know, I know, I watch people all the time, like, and I'll tell somebody to relax on a jug. I'm like, okay, more, okay, more, okay, more. And you're always getting lower and lower. You're letting go of the holds more and more. You're sinking more into your feet. You're turning more into the position that you actually want. And you're like, whoa, I was spending maybe 60% more than I should have for a relaxed position. So teach yourself how to relax on the wall. I do that in my warm up almost every single climbing day. Almost every single climbing day in my warm up. My warm up is kind of about finding relaxed positions. Because if I can go the extremes in one way, I can go the extremes in the other way. But anyway, that, that, that's, that's two other things that I wanted to add. Before I hear your, thank you. And before I hear your pro tip, I just, I want to share something. I think we've shared on the sport climbing podcast about resting. I got this, I think from watching Ethan Pringle, where I would just see him go through a hard section and then get to a jug. And I call it 
dying a little bit. They, it, you just watch them. They're like, ah, like seriously maxing out. And then they grab the jug and you just watch them melt. Just like, oh, and they almost look like they're just going to like fall off. You, you see their shoulders. So everything just melt or, or I call it dying a little. And then they clip, by the way, too. I, I always like saying that, like, don't clip before you've rested. There's, uh, yeah, there's no need to clip when you're at a rest until you feel rested. Uh, and we have uh, another sport, another top sport climber in the pipeline. And that, that's something that I want to go deeper on with some of the, the best of the best is what they think about with resting. What, how do they know when they're ready to go? You, you know, you mentioned that you have, you knew how long you're resting at place. Yeah, I wonder if does Adam Andra have like a watch? Does he start getting this dialed? And I, I also want to emphasize what you said where understand what you're resting to. Uh, I think I talked about this in a podcast where I had some knee bar before a crux and I literally would go in and push as hard as I could with my foot and knee on that knee bar to relax as much as I could on everything else. And I would leave when that knee bar would fail. Like, I mean, I, I literally would just, my, my leg would give out and I, would, and I said to myself, okay, it's time to go. Uh, so, all right, Tim, your pro tip. All right. I got a pro tip. Um, this is completely shifting gears, but uh, make bets with your friends for your climbing. No, not money, unless you really want to add money and you can afford it. Um, but make like flash challenge, like make like flash challenge bets for like push ups or pull ups or, you know, a core workout or something, just a fun incentive. Or like, you know, maybe you guys are going to go out for dinner and someone's going to pay for dinner or something like that. Like make it fun or just do it for yourself. But make bets, make some incentives, you know, make repeat day flash challenges. Like if you um, just sent a multi try project or a multi session project or something, try to do a first try the next time you go in and add some incentive. Incentives are really hard to find naturally in climbing. I think a lot of us want to have fun in our sessions. A lot of us want to train in sessions and either go way too hard or way too little in the incentives. But finding those types of incentives to add external pressure, um, I think, I think helps just to learn how to deal with that pressure and have, have emotions regularly in your sessions. Um, I kind of do this regularly. Um, one little caveat there, good challenges that make sense are really, really important. So finding something that is not too obviously difficult, not too obviously easy, uh, things that probably are more likely going to cause falls than failure. I think failure is just straight up, you cannot do it. Falls just happen from making mistakes. Those types of falls, probably happen more often in climbing than failures happen and you can find them in your gyms but you know i love the coordination challenge things i love just like the well if i if my foot stays on this move i, I i'm gonna stick it those types of challenges for me are really good to make bets on because you can solve them because you can make them more consistent because climbing isn't a guessing game because when i go into the gym a lot of the time i try to perfect these things and i'm a high baller i i take the tries away you know i i, I add the incentive in a, in a specific way i'm adding this pro tip obviously because i find a lot of joy in this type of climbing but also it's made me a real good climber you know it's made me go to the point where i can say all right well if is this the try is this the try i'm not gonna fall why right if i can't answer that question i might as well not i might as well not take the rope off right but i can answer that question and i'm pretty confident answering that question a lot of the time and i've i have a pretty good track record i'm not dead yet so I think I think in general these things have these things help a lot with a lot of things that I can identify in my climbing that actually provide success and uh, yeah it's it's good for you guys. I, I like that nervous laugh after I, I'm not dead yet. Ah, uh, I uh, yeah, be careful uh, rolling those dice forever. Sometimes it's outside of your control. Uh, yeah, if anyone wants, to, but not in the gym. Not in the gym. Yeah. I I still love that podcast. I think I even know the number off the top of my head. It was Tim's best day. I think it was number 28 where we really went behind the scenes on focus. And it's heavy when you uh, have those extreme things where you have to perform on that try. And I it kind of reminded me of that podcast we did about performance under pressure. And I, I think we talked a little bit about trying to up the stakes in everyday life. So I, I think that's a, I just, I really like that. And it's fun. I. I I like this. I, I I remember getting challenged when I first went out to Bishop. Someone said, "If you flash Pope's Pro, I'll I'll buy you. You know, I'll buy the beer tonight." Uh, and I did not flash it. I think it was hard. It's a dude. It's a V six too. Like Bishop is the best place for like V six flash challenges or like V four flash challenges. No, Yosemite. Actually, Yosemite. just flash challenges in general. I'm gonna put out Yosemite. Yosemite. Uh, it's just 
Nice. I, I will if 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 you are listening and you flashed uh or and after this you flashed blue suede shoes, I will buy you a beer next time I see you. Uh, and by the, and by the way, I also like turning this on its head. Where let's say you're on a trip, you got some hard climb, and you know you you set you you did your thing, you did your your goal for the day. Oftentimes, it's someone will buy you a beer. They say, "Hey, congrats, Josh." I like I like doing it the other way, where when I have success, I often buy beers for my friends because I'm flying high. I, it's, it's like, this was my, this was a great day for me. Let me buy the first round. And so I just, that's totally off topic, but I always thought that was a fun way to change no, it. I love that. Yeah. Okay, Tim, good pro tip. Uh, let's go on to the topic of the day that we, we hinted at a little bit. We went into a little bit and it's, it's about, it's about prioritizing your training and, and how you fit it all in. I actually think in some ways, this is a continuation of the last podcast we did. That one was focused on figuring out your, your North Star in training. We're not just figuring out your North Star, more like making sure your North Star is appropriate and correct for how to continue to progress. And the reason why that's connected is because we don't have unlimited time. We don't have unlimited psych. And so it really is important to understand what the North Star is and then making sure that how we schedule our time and our psych aligns with that. And we're all dealing with different forms of time constraints. And this is where I, I brought this up earlier. I think it's going to be kind of interesting hearing how you uh, handle it, because like I said, you're busy, you travel and you do. So you're busy in, in a way that's entirely different from mine. And yeah, I'm curious to see how it, uh, how it pans out in our discussion. And, but before I, I go into, I just want to, Shout out to to Noah for this question, and also my old buddy Jesse. Uh, I I get this question often. This is definitely a consistent thing, typically from people w with kids. To be honest, Tim, usually uh, sixteen year olds don't message me saying that they're struggling w with finding time to climb. Uh, but anyways, yeah, th thanks to you guys for uh, for pushing this, and I think it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, double shout out. I mean, it's it's hard to find those answers and it's hard to i think rely on other people to but we're all in this together we're all trying to get better at the same time and you know uh i'm, I'm excited to tackle this i i really have three points um and i love what you're saying it, it does totally kind of piggyback off our previous podcast and uh, my, my first point uh, maybe i'll go into this and then we can just go back and forth or, or whatever but uh, my first point is uh think something that i constantly think about i do also like that you're mentioning josh that you and i are busy in different ways uh, the, the way that I'm busy in is I kind of just session when I can, man. Like, and, and, and so do you, right? But like, I really don't know when my next session is going to be. And like for you, maybe it's better for you to look at your whole week and plug it in when it makes the most sense based on your schedule. And you can see when you're going to session next. But it's really psychologically hard to be like, well, what's today's going to, what's today? I know I can session today for like five hours, but like, I don't know when the next time I'm going to get to the gym is. So what am I going to do today to set my session up the most? Granted, uh, a couple of things. I didn't session like this for a long time, right? Like I was that 13 year. I started climbing at 13. By the time I was like 18 or 19, I had had, you know, like many, many, many weeks of like no rest days. Like I had so much time to train and so much. So my body did set up for a really good amount of volume. Like it's, it's very robust. Like my, my body can handle a lot of really intricate training. I think that's really important to check for yourself. Like check how much you can handle. If you're in a place where you can't even handle much, maybe this isn't even a good place to, to go. Like maybe the best thing to do is just condition. Like I'll, I'll definitely take a bunch of time off. After focus, I took like two months off of climbing, man. And all I did when I got back was like, I still was super busy, but I was just conditioning. I was like, I don't even care what my climbing looks like. I don't even care anything. Like unless I'm at to a place where I can even handle the type of training that I want to give myself, I'm going to get there first. And it only takes a couple of weeks. It only takes like a couple of consistent sessions of doing like X, Y, and Z workouts. And for me, the workouts are always the same. So it makes it easy. If that's where you are, just design a conditioning plan. It doesn't take that long. Like it just find a couple of things that you know are really good for you, where you're really behind and where you're really good and then where you're like really, really ahead and just make a good training plan for yourself. But okay, here's my first note. Pick three North Stars. Okay, so we talked about North Stars. Tim, there's not uh, three North bit. Stars. There's only one North Star, <laughs> Tim. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you why you can pick three North Stars. One that's a year away, one that's a month away, and one that's a week away. Let these guide your sessions. So what the one-year North Stars 
are just longer term North Stars. And I kind of want to hear like you break down these types of North Stars for yourself as well. What does a, a one year North Star look like? Um, because for me, these things always change. So I didn't really pick specific things. A one month North Star. So one year North Stars are things that are very long term, you know, uh, very, very big habits. If you say hip mobility a lot, that's probably a one year North Star. It's not a one month North Star even. You're not even going to see you know, significant gains a month from now. You're going to see those gains a year from now. You know, because regardless of your sessioning three times that week or, you know, you have a training cycle or whatever, these are important things that you can Im implement in your warm up, you know, just a little bit in your in your head where you're just doing a regular climbing session, regardless if you're moonboarding, you're trying a new set or are at a gym that doesn't have good climbing or whatever. This is one North Star that you can pick that is, again, in your warm up, in the on the wall or off the wall talk to yourself where you're like, oh, like I should just maybe instead of trying this climb, I should try that climb because I have this one year North Star that is always telling me that this is something that I should work on. One month specific things. These are probably for me, two different things, more specific weaknesses. Like we were talking about finger grip, right? Like finger uh, variation. Like, do you always open hand drag? Like, do you always full crimp? Do you like, those are things that can work over a month and not even a week, not even a year, over a month. Those things can change. Do you have specific projects soon in a month? Are you going to go on a trip in a month or two? These are North Stars that also are really, really important for me. If I know I'm going to go, what, September now, like, I, again, my month is going to look crazy. My next month is going to look crazy, but I know I'm going to Yosemite, you know, this week. I know I'm going to go outdoors for the next couple of weeks. So what am I going to do in my session today? I'm going to moonboard. I'm just going to grab some holds that make me uncomfortable because when I go outside, I generally just grab holds and they hurt more. They just hurt more than the gym. That's really easy one month North Star for me. One week are the little habits. The one, month, the one week North Star are the little habits you've been trying to remember and perfect. Breath work, more overhang, less foot cuts, like those types of things. Pacing, like those are things that you can do that day. You know, that next week, you can see those habits kind of kind of grow over time. Uh, if there's one, you know, one tip that I really could give for this prioritizing when busy type thing, if you have the one session that's the end all be all, this is the one tip I can give is just pick a one year North Star, a one month North Star and a one week North Star. I think those are for me, like regularly in my sessions, I've been doing that in the last two years. Um, but that's, yeah. Yeah. That's what you think. You see, that's so interesting because that's such a different approach than me when I think about prioritizing and, and it goes to exactly what you're saying, where you don't know what is coming this week or this month or the, honestly, you're, it's always a bit up in the air for you. I think that's an interesting way to think about, I, I do want to point out that we're using the term North star twice. Like this is a little different than when we were talking about North star. In the previous podcast. I should have picked it there. I'm sorry. Yeah. We'll, 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 what's the, I don't know. We can't come up with it on, on, on the fly, but you know, the North Star in our previous podcast is really around this idea of like learning how to learn, really getting better at climbing is your North Star when it comes to being a climber. Uh, That's like the North Star above these North Stars. That's like the, 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 what the do you North, think about in how general? How many for freaking climbing? North Stars are there? Um, anyways, uh, I also want to tackle something that you said and just add the the context of how freaking good you are and how experienced you are. You made a comment about how sometimes you take time off and the idea of hopping back into intense training maybe isn't appropriate and you even stay off the wall and do some conditioning. And I know why you said that because I know how much climbing you were doing before focus and i know i mean you even you talked about on the podcast literally the insane volume you were doing in the days leading up to that and then in actually doing it i mean doing any one of those climbs would be exhausting for that day doing five is absolutely mind-blowing so I, I just caution almost anyone from listening that the key or that you are ever in a position to just not be on the wall and to just kind of condition I've done that a few times in the past when I'm coming back from an injury, let's say, where I just kind of need, I, I need to get my body moving again, but maybe mentally I'm not quite ready to get in the gym and, and try hard. So yeah, just remember that Tim is literally a professional climber. And when he talks about taking time off from actual sport of climbing, it's because he has logged so many freaking hours in the last couple of years that it's it's hard to fathom so just wanted to put that context oh in. thanks <laughs> i i do kind of forget sometimes that this is kind of even even though things get busy and stuff like it's still my it's still like my number one thing that i do constantly 
but yeah, I do put a lot of work into it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, you know, it doesn't mean someone listening because uh, we, I, I am amazed when we get messages from multiple V15 climbers that listen to the podcast. So it could still apply to you, but you'll probably know who you are if you're, if you're one of those, but uh, yeah. So I guess how I want to start is just, it's really tricky when you hear us talk about limit sessions, focusing on technique. Oh, you got to have some endurance. We're talking about sport climbing slabs and footwork. Really, really important. Yeah. You got, you got to know how much weight you can put on that tiny little foot chip on the volume. And then Tim's like, oh, dude, you got to do breath work. And it's a lot. And uh, we, we zoom in and out. We talk about how you just need to focus on fundamentals or you need to get breath work integrated or all this, you know, we really zoom in and out. And, and that's what we're here to do. I, I talked about in the beginning, it's, it's nuance, you guys. We're, we're, we're talking the highest. We're trying to be the best we can be. And, and it doesn't just come down to a super basic program or something. There's always nuance when you're looking to, to master something. And I guess one of the most important concepts for me when I think about prioritizing is that there's time and there's psych. And they aren't the same thing. You could have a lot of time, but be exhausted. And it, it makes me want to bring up that thing I talked about in the last podcast, that, that little Dave McLeod anti, uh, anecdote where he said you could, you could go do hangboard in a bunch of different ways, but the way to really see results is to show up with intention, right? You need to, you could be a type A personality and you just force in all these sessions. You're like, oh, I got to do my slab work for 90 minutes also. Uh, or you might be, and I, people I know do this, oh, I'll, I'll do my hangboarding during a Zoom meeting at work. Like I'll literally be listening to a Zoom meeting and be doing hangboarding. That, that's not me. That, that is not how I do things uh, because it just doesn't work like that. You have these finite resources. It's not just time, it's your intention also. And so I just caution you from showing up half-assing it and you're not going to get the results you're looking for. And I would argue that you're probably better off constraining your goals or, or simplifying to one thing. And instead of trying to do all the sessions, find that, I'm, I don't want to use North Star, find that thing that you know you need and focus on it. So I, I talked about that in my finger training. I'm, I'm, I want to get better at small edges. So when I do hangboard, I do not hangboard on 20 mils. I do not do four different grip, grip types at the same time. I only focus on the tiny edges and I listen to hardcore rap. <laughs> well, I'm doing it. And I say that, that made Tim bust up. Because I'm not on a freaking Zoom meeting. I'm not playing with my kids at the same time. I may only have 45 minutes, but I'm going to freaking be there to do that thing. And, uh, yeah, we can go in, like, we'll go into some more practical tips. But I just, I really want to emphasize that if you're going to do it, show up to do it and don't do a million things. And this is the, the we need to climb. And then, actually, I'm going to just stop there. I'm going to stop there. Dude, so good. Like, I, there's two things that I kind of wanted to echo on. First of all, the zoom in and out thing, um, just about our podcast in general, I think it's a really good point. Um, I think that we're getting better at realizing what kind of information goes out to you guys. Uh, we're also realizing who our audience is a little bit more, and it's definitely a lot more diverse than we thought. And so if you're finding yourself frustrated because you're like, but they said this and that means this. And it's like, well, that's exactly what we're doing in our heads. We're just zooming in and out. And that's well, a really important perspective. Join our freaking have. classrooms. And, <laughs> you know, that is what our classrooms are often about is people say, you said this. I don't totally get it. You know, I, I don't. I think that it's important to keep on picking at it. And I, I like what you said, where there's a lot of people out there telling you about hangboard protocols or whatever the case may be. And we're all kind of circumambulating. Oh, that's, there's a tricky word. Where that's a cool. Word. Yeah, it means you're you're walking around the the thing itself. No no one can just mm -hmm. give you the 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 trick. Like it, it's like we talked about with with Will. There's no just oh, if you tell me this, all of a sudden I will be great at climbing. We're all kind of walking around. Is is it you know this 
uh, way? Is it a drop knee? Is it a, you know, is it this training pro program? Is it this mental attitude? And we still get our minds blown, or at least I do, Tim, uh, and I still have epiphanies to this day, 30 years later. And that's why talking to Nathaniel Coleman and you hear his take mm -hmm. on it. Does that mean that Adamandra has the same mental approach as Nathaniel Coleman? No. Like, but does that mean Adamandra's is wrong? No. Uh, but yeah, hearing, sharing, uh, it, it helps you narrow in on and, and make it your own. Cause at the end of the day, you have to make it your own. And, uh, yeah, the nuances yeah. is, uh, is required. Yeah. I think that's really cool. What you're saying, we're, we're all kind of just circling around the idea because there's a lot of experts in climbing, but most of the experts are just out there doing it or figuring out how to be experts. People talking about climbing right now, like in the climbing media, in where it is right now, are a lot of couch experts. Right? A lot of people are just watching and thinking that they're experts. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not saying that's bad. That's awesome. That's awesome that people are interested in talking about those things. But just remember that. Just remember that the experts are the ones that you're watching, not the ones that are talking about the thing that you're trying to become or trying to do. The experts are the ones doing it, right? So really know the difference between what you're looking at, what you're watching, and what you're listening to. And yeah, Josh and I are pretty damn good at climbers, like both of us are. So that's why a lot of the stuff that comes out can be a little bit more nuanced. You know, like we're still not as expert as someone like Adam Andra. But, you know, I do think that that's the type of, that's the reason why things come out in the way that we try to talk about. Well, it. and this brings me to my number one thing when it comes to prioritizing is you got to do the thing that you want to get better at. So if you, yeah, I mentioned vertical granite climbing, which is, to be honest, isn't exactly what I want to get better at, but uh, <laughs> uh, you have to go and do it. Like if... If you want to get better at something, you just, you, you have to do it. And uh, you can't spend your time on the hangboard, on, you know, squatting, listening to this podcast and think that that's the key to getting better at whatever the thing is. And so that that's always to me the priority. And I take those sessions extremely seriously, right? So if you have, you want to get better at your, local climbing area, you, know, you have some projects in Bishop or Tahoe or Red Rocks or Rifle, whatever the case may be, whatever, whenever you can get out and do it. First of all, sacrifice everything else around your life to do those sessions. So if you want to get better at Rifle, go to Rifle. That might mean not doing that hangboard session. That might mean not doing, you know, a moonboard session. So just really recognize Again, this is, this is that North Star idea, right? Like, and then when you're doing those uh, sessions, focus, you, you know, take it seriously. I argue that it's not so much training. Now you're performing and you're really paying attention. This is where our, our tips and tricks of understanding how to move, where to put your attention, how to break down a crux. Use these kind of general guidelines that we give on those sessions that are so crucial for you man i, I want to take this back uh because this is kind of a new point but you just mentioned um the the importance of focusing in your session and you know you're kind of mentioning that it's not like you're going to hangboard during a zoom call or anything like that because that literally is the reason why your training is so, Tim, so people, that you can focus i'm telling you people literally oh, do I that and i i know from being a busy dad it's people are on their email during their climbing sessions they're sending emails Right. And it's, it's, it's a mistake. It's, it's a mistake. Yeah. It's hard. It's super hard to focus. And one thing that also, you kind of mentioned it briefly that I see a lot of people do as well is that they train and train and train and train, and then they go out and send, and they think those are two different things. They think it's two different mental approaches. It is not the best climbers, man. Simon Hibbler, uh, is someone that I've competed with for a long time. This guy's a machine. He's a freak machine. He trains like a maniac. He's probably got the most power output on the climbing wall or on like campus board rung holes that I've I think ever seen, but definitely in America, he's one of the strongest on the campus board. He's just a training freak. And uh, after a competition, he put a poll up on his Instagram story uh, that was uh, for my, for my uh, professional athlete friends or like high level athlete friends. Do you feel more mentally exhausted after a competition or after training? And I was one of few people who clicked training. I don't, I don't feel mentally exhausted as much. I feel totally thrash and trash. Like I don't want to talk much. I just want to like go and, you know, stop climbing or, or whatever after a competition. But I definitely want to do that way more after training. After training is the most exhausting I'll feel. And that just gives a little bit of insight into what training should be, in my opinion. And 
I think a mistake that a lot of people have when it comes to, and maybe this is the beauty of competition and competition climbing and why a lot of competition climbers may just be better because they train like that. I think a lot of competition athletes train, each training session is like a competition. So that when you get to the competition, it's not so, it's not so insane. What about your weekend warriors? What about those guys? You should do the same thing. Every training session should be exactly what you're trying to do in the weekend because it's what you're trying to do, right? I think it's just one point that I wanted to make um, before I go into uh, my second point, which is almost exactly what Josh's second point was, but I'm trying to peel another layer from that. And my second point there is try to focus on trying hard. And I'm going to say, sounds easy, but what about all the criticism and correcting in your head? Deal with that stuff in your warm up in order to have a great focus session. Now, what I mean by that is I think trying hard is really, really hard. I think it's way harder than any of you guys think. I think it's way harder than even most professional climbers realize. And I think just the fact that you can absorb that and be aware that trying hard, focusing on trying hard takes a lot. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of like awareness and seeing how you're even criticizing yourself. I know. Dude, the reason why I say this is because all of us go into climbing sessions and the first thing we do is check ourselves. Instead of going into stretching or doing our thing, the first thing we do is check ourselves. First thing is, how are you feeling? Like, oh, I'm going to go grab this crimp. Like, how does this feel today? It's like, oh, it feels way worse. It feels way better. Like, whatever you say will dictate your session, right? No, it shouldn't be like that. You should just check those things, have that awareness, and then commit to the try hard. Just get to the warm up and be like, all right, no matter how I feel, I find very specific things to do. I find my, my joint motion. I find my breath work. And then I, I make an agreement to myself that once I pull on, I'm going to focus on my footwork, committing to these types of movements. Like I just get very specific, right? If you, can't, if you find yourself not being able to do that because you're busy, if you find yourself because you're missing three days in a row and no, no wonder you're going to feel like shit when you get onto the wall. No wonder your power, your, your endurance is going to feel worse. Like, well, if you focus on those things and you focus on how that's going to make you feel, guess what you're not focusing on? trying hard, right? You're not. And what does trying hard actually look like? It's specific. It's very specific to specific styles of climbs, specific movements that you're doing. Going back to those one year, one month, and one week north stars, it's very specific to those types of things. You can, you can figure out for yourself what try hard actually looks like. Just realize that you're probably not doing it very often, right? Because we're so worried about these other things. And don't, I'm just saying this because I do it all the time. Like I, I get off sessions and I'm like, like, I'll get off a moon board, try or whatever, and be like, oh, dude, that was horrible. Like, all this stuff. Like, I feel it. it's like, shh, shut up, shut up. Just like, all right, let's focus. Like, you know, I always tell myself, I don't know. I think, I think that's a word. The one mental word I have in my mind more often than anything is a little bit more mean than this, but I just say shut up. Like, that's the one thing I tell myself constantly because there's so much going on where I'm judging myself and directing my session. It's like, dude, we have we're talking about very specific uh, trajectories in our sessions. And it's like, dude, these are really hard to get to. These are really hard to get to because we have so many distractions and criticisms. Dude, that, that, isn't that the same thing that Nathaniel Coleman talked about when he's on the world cup stage and he falls? It's, 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 it's it's, I like the shut up. It's, it's just an interesting way to think about just, just be there. Don't listen to the self-talk. I find that really interesting. And, and, but I do think it's hard to enter that mental state. And this is why this is why it's hard to show up after a busy day of work and have a good session you know, or, or in the middle of the day. You know, I, I just it's really hard for me to switch gears. Sometimes I'm running around. I just picked up my daughter from gymnastics. I'm, you know, put something in the oven and luckily the nanny's here and I can, uh, you know, I have the next hour to myself and shifting into that mindset and being there and leaving it all behind is super difficult. Uh, and for me, that, that kind of, kind of brings up this other reality. And we're talking about showing up and doing the thing. So it's like, okay, okay, Josh. Okay. Here, Tim, I, I hear you like, I'm going to show up for whatever my, my main session is my limit session. And I'm going to do my best and really take it seriously. But sometimes you show up and you're wrecked, right? Like, you know, you just are wrecked. And, and this to me is where time is not always the issue. Sometimes it's psych and you just had a long day and you show up and it's supposed to be an amazing session and you can't, you, you just, you're, you don't want to be there. And I think something that's a really important concept is understanding that you may have a plan A, but you should have a plan B, C, D, E, F. And I think one of the important things to understand is that 
because we're all here trying to be great, not just trying to be okay, we, we want to be as good as we can. Ask yourself, what would it be like if, I don't know, LeBron James shows up and he's not feeling good. And he tells his coach, he's just like, dude, you know, today, well, actually, and, and think about this as a training session, not, not, you know, finals game number seven. And he's just like, today's not my day. Like, I'm not feeling good. And, and he knows this. Like, it's not like he's just being lazy. He's like, I, today's not my day. It is going to be probably one out of a hundred times where the coach turns him around and says, okay, go home, right? There's going to be, it's, it's, it's about meeting him where he's at in that day. And so you can start picking this apart. It's like, okay, uh, I showed up for the session on Thursday night. My whole crew is here. Today's going to be, there's new boulders. I'm going to dedicate myself to that V12 over there. That's going to be my session today. And then you feel terrible. It's how do you ratchet that down and still say, I'm showing up and, and getting, I'm taking this session seriously, but I, I can't, I don't have it all today. And yeah, it might be, uh, sometimes I think it's as simple as just not expecting so much from yourself saying it just, it's kind of like what you said, Tim, where you check yourself and you don't feel so good. And so you let that get in your head versus just giving it what you have for that day. I remember uh, John Cardwell in our uh, episode with him talked about how some days he just knows he's going to be at 70%, but that doesn't mean he doesn't give a hundred percent of that 70%. And you know, accepting that and not go, you know, not forcing yourself to give a hundred percent on that moment is, is an important little wiggle room. And you can start just kind of like, you know, lowering it each time you say, okay, like plan C may be that I'm there. Uh, but I'm not going to go for the V12 that I know is my epic project. I really want to understand I'm going to do the V10. I'm, I'm going to focus on technique on lower angles than, than normal. Uh, you know, wherever the case may be, just keep, keep scaling. It could be sport climbing. It could be, honestly, it could be one of the better ones, I think, is just warming up, showing up, warming up, and then deciding if you want to go home or not. Because a lot of what, happens hmm. with warming up is that it's not just physical it's that context switching it's it's recognizing where you are and getting into the flow and at least if you do that you build a habit and you might find that actually today is your day which is always interesting uh when you feel terrible and then you warm up you start going like actually yeah I feel good um and, you know you can keep going down the list and I'll, I'll i'll finish up quick tim it's like it might just be showing up, talking to your friends, doing a few pull-ups, at least you showed up. That's half the battle. Just like that whole warming up thing. Sometimes it's go, you know, go on a walk or stretch, but honestly, it's just, it's very rarely do nothing. Like just really have that in your head. How often is it that you are so wrecked that you should do nothing? And so then anyways, just scale it. Don't, it's not binary. Uh, and give yourself the opportunity to give what you have that day. This is why I love podcasting, dude. I have so much. I have so much good stuff to go back to. I'm like a bobblehead. This pod. I love the podcast where I'm a bobblehead. Where I'm just like, yes, like everything Josh said. We got put like, on I'm YouTube. Like, yes. What are we doing, Tim? Like, I'll get on YouTube. <laughs> I swear. I swear. I love what you're saying, but dude, I have to mention this is so stupid. I was just giggling so hard when you brought up LeBron James because I was just picturing LeBron James bringing his black diamond duffel into the gym, like putting his climbing shoes on, and I was like, what? Like, what is Josh talking about? Why is LeBron James climbing? Like, oh. <laughs> His training session. Sorry, I thought that was really funny. By the way, in my notes, I, I had it as Nathaniel Coleman, the Olympian, <laughs> and then I just forgot. I, and I just looked and I realized I was supposed to refer to, to the Olympian. Uh, anyways, LeBron, yeah. Yeah, but dude, such a good point that you're bringing up. Like, yeah, dude, of course his coach is not going to be like, oh, you feel like shit today? Go home. He's like, no, dude. All right, well, let's talk about it. Why do you, why, why do you feel like these things? And that's actually one really big point that I want to... Um, well, what about that one out of 100 days where you do want to turn around? First of all, I think that's also really important. Just check yourself. Is it that day? Or is that that day? Is that that one out of 100 days where you should just go home? All right, if it's not, then stop crying and let's get to it. First, that's a really important place to be. If it is that one day, go home. That's a really important place And feel place good to be about well. it. Be, and feel good about it, yeah. And, and give yourself some time to feel bad about yourself too because that's okay, right? Like I think, again, that's another important thing. I brought up this one. Uh, that Adriel, a coach that I worked with for a long time, 
he brought up this emotional backpack concept. And I'm not going to go into that because I talked about it in a podcast once. Um, but the real idea there is give yourself some time to feel bad about the things that you feel bad about. Because if you're not letting go of it and you're trying to climb, if you're not letting go of it and you're trying to train, if you're not letting go of it, you're trying to talk to somebody, you're not letting go of it, right? And the trick to letting go of things is to feel bad about those things, is to actually feel those things. Whatever is bothering you, like really get bothered. Like let, it, let yourself feel those things fully, then drop them, then, or just realize that you don't have the time to deal with it now. Just realize that you'll get to it later. Just realize that you can deal with it maybe now for like 30 seconds and then move on, then go to work, right? If you haven't let go of those things, mm, chances are like, I really will sit for like maybe 15 to 30 minutes before I even start my warm up or in my warm up. Uh, and I love what you're saying, dude, about like maybe that session before you really go into the session is just the warm up first and then figure out if you want to go to the session or not. Because, man, I take that so seriously, dude. Like, I usually, I don't think I've ever walked away after the warm up because I just convinced myself that it's going to be fun no matter how I feel. But I will go into the session and be like, today, dude, just might be a warm up, just might be that session where you just warm up. And during that warm up, I'm feeling like usually like, oh, the, that work call that I have is just like horrible. Like that breakfast I have is just, dude, like what F that person that I just, you know, ran into at that traffic light, like whatever. I'm like, all right, dope. Like now I can go for my session. Now I can get stoked and like do all these things. I'm really just dealing with a lot of things that I just dealing with in my life. And then I let them go because I'm there to do something. And I love that. Um, lower your expectations, right? If you had a goal and you, you know, you had a goal for that session, you, there's a new set or there's that old project or whatever. And you're like, dude, but today, all I came here for was that one thing. And it's like, well, <laughs> dude, like today is not going to be that day that you do that. Or it might be, but you just like think about how much success you can have with that, with that, oh, man, I almost said North Star again. With that being your goal for the day, with that being your goal for the day, you have very little room to succeed. You have very little ch chance to succeed. We talked this, about this on a pod uh, a long time ago. Maybe it was a pro tip where like, Make easier wins, dude. Like, find easier ways to win. If you can just win from like finding three breaths in one warm up climbs, like that's a lot easier to win than sending that one rig. Success you know, and begets I, success is a really common success begets success. Statement. And that's why so many times when you send a little warm up prod, you're like, oh, uh, that that's the day that you often send your your main prods, mm -hmm. right? Dude, I had so many sessions um, where we would do team practice, and these team practices were relentless. But you know, my very first uh, comp team when I was like thirteen to sixteen years old, there were so many sessions where I would do a three-hour team practice. I would usually get there the earliest and warm up a lot, and then like do my you know warm up projects or whatever. Then we would do the whole team practice, do half-hour power work at the end, and then I would start my projects. After the team practice, I would start trying my projects because it's not like you know. Isaac, our coach, was going to let me project instead of doing drills and whatnot. We were doing a bunch of drills all the time. I was like, well, I got my drills done. Now I can project. And the amount of projects I would send after team practice was insane. I'd be like, well, of course I'm not going to send the project. It was more of that reality versus like, well, if I want to send my project, I have to do these things. It's like, no, of course I'm not going to send my project. But if I was to, these are all the things that I would do. And I just started to adjust my thought process towards, well, if I was to, this is what it would look like. Of course, I'm not going to. I'm cooked. I'm tired. Like, but if I was to, I would climb like this. I would project like this. I would rest like this. And I just put myself in the ideal without really hoping for the ideal, if that makes sense. I'm just cracking up, Tim, because we're talking about prioritizing and not having enough uh, time or energy. And you're talking about how you would go practice for three hours and then keep climbing afterwards. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's let's get more specific and recognize the, these kind of two types of issues when it comes to prioritizing. There's lacking time and then there's lacking energy. All right. Uh, it, because, and I think they really are different. They're, they're often pretty similar because it's, especially if you're you know, older, that other time is often full of must do things that are stressful, like a crazy business meeting, crying kids. And then when you finally have time, you find yourself exhausted. And it's really important to point out that all kinds of stress take away from your physical ability. As in, literally, if you had a really hard day at work and you're a desk jockey, you will be physically tired when you go to do a session. Like it's, I know you were just sitting behind a desk, but just recognize that stress is stress is stress, whether it's physical or mental or emotional. Uh, and so really important to point out, but if you have less than an hour, you, you probably, you, 
it, you might just be better off going for a walk and listening to a test piece podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, I just want to really point out that if you don't have an, an hour, it, it's really, it's really hard. And if you don't have any energy and, you know, I, I talk about bringing intention and how you need to show up and you can't have acid, but there are a few things that you could do. Uh, you could go for a walk. You can do some of that like super low intensity arc training where you're just literally cruising on five, six for 20 minutes. Uh, there's a really good podcast or not podcast. It's a really good YouTube by Dave McLeod on his training for Rhapsody, that E11, where he just talks about this kind of endurance training he did where it was not stressful or hard. He was just cruising. Uh, you could do some foam rolling or mobility work in front of the TV. You could do some of those minimum hangs that Dr. Uh, Cooper recommended or Emil Abramson. Uh, maybe, you know, so those are a couple of things that if you're really wrecked, you could just kind of do that half ass. You could just kind of show up, phone it in and actually, you know, get a little bit of results uh, from it. But if you don't have, if you have the psych, but not the time again, go for climbing still, right? Like you need an hour, almost certainly. And, you know, warm up fast by staying on the wall you know, move from boulder to boulder really quickly or route to route, just get in that, you know, 20 minute uh, shift. I, I would recommend having a, a, some music or the same song that you listen to every time to really get you in that zone quickly. It's something I, I do is uh, I have a, the same playlist and a few songs from it. I know that it's time to perform, you know, time to climb. And so I, I really encourage you to have some ritual that gets your mind right. And this is, this is really ridiculous. This is a good one to share. Uh, literally smelling my, my gym clothes with chalk and sweat. Like it, it it's like part of it. I, I, like it wakes me up. I'm like, okay, that's what I'm here for. Right. I know. I, I thought you'd like that one. I just really wanted to, to, to put it all out there. Um, and then find something that's, that's really hard, right? Like we're talking about that these sessions, if you don't have much time, show up, and take it seriously and do something that is for real. And again, put those tips that we have around deconstructing the, the crux, uh, understanding what to focus on. Try really hard, like Tim was saying, really bring out that try hard and bring your A game where it comes to learning how to climb and go ham. Like you, you, if you really find one limit climb, whether that's a boulder or a sport route, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, including all that resting, like you, you can have a damn good section session. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have more to say on that, Tim, but I just, I, I want to just really emphasize getting in that hour climbing where you're really performing at your highest level. Your mind is right. You're doing your best. If you can get that in a few times a week, it may not, it may not be everything, but you better have that. Like if you don't have that, you're not going anywhere. Man, I had, I love what you're saying about this. It's probably a time or effort um, or a mixture of both as to, you know, what's constraining your sessions um, or your ability to have sessions. And I really, I really felt this. Uh, I think in the last, before this winter, the last year before that, I averaged two sessions for two hours a week. That's all I could climb. That's all I did climb. I was still getting better. Like I, I, we were podcasting constantly and I was like, I don't know, I just climbed like my second session this week and I still feel better. Like I still feel on one, like whatever, because I'm just trying to focus that whole time. I had time to go in and do like a 30 minute hangboard routine. I had time occasionally to like go and do mobility or like go and train cardio or like do pull-ups or whatever. I had the time. What I didn't have was the effort. I didn't care during that time. And I just chose to spend those times relaxing and like focusing on my mental health rather than training. And if you feel yourself forcing that too often, I think that can get in the way of getting your next burst of, of good effort. It's not that, you know, I really want to make that clear. It's not Damn, necessarily like that. that. Yeah, you know, like I, of course I had time, but there was, there were few times that I would go to the gym psyched, you know, that was a given for me when I was young. But, you know, especially when you're working and especially when you're talking, you know, the co coach, I was coaching like six or seven sessions a day sometimes when you're talking to people that much about rock climbing and doing rock climbing coaching for six or seven hours at a time to just one person, it's exhausting. And I don't want to climb after that. So I did it. 
I had time to, but I didn't have the stoke to. I love that what you're saying. And then when you have the time, it's like, well, then spend it, use the luxury, like really take that stuff seriously, right? And if, yeah, that's something to so, check for, for everybody. Yeah, so what I heard that I thought was really important there, Tim, is you may have had the time to do all the, the minutia, but you saved it to put the effort into those sessions when you needed them. And so rather than doing a hangboard, it sounds great. Like, oh, I have 30 minutes here. I could do a hangboard routine, but that, that would have taken away from that one or two sessions you had that week where you could really bring it. And I, so important there. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that, okay, like we just broke it down to the exact most basic thing. Like, yeah, if you only had two hours a week, this is what you should do. And the, the next thing to think about stacking onto that is what are you actually weak on? Right? Like what, like what is your low hanging fruit? And in some ways, if you don't know what it is, then you probably don't need to do any training. Like, I, I mean, I, I just kind of full stop. I like that. I, yeah, like if you're like, I don't know, like my, I'm kind of weak on power, but you know, small holds are really tricky too. And maybe campusing, it's like, you know, uh, then maybe, maybe you don't need to train because it should be kind of crystal, crystal clear to you. And this is where I, you know, I keep talking about micro edges. And the reason I keep talking about micro edges for me is because it's, it is a freaking weakness and it's, it's probably my lowest hanging fruit. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, it's, it's always nice to, to get checked by. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I want to echo that really hard. I actually, man, I didn't even realize that I spent most of my two, two and a half, you know, two hour sessions a week spending those sessions finding my low hanging fruits. Actually, most of the time, those sessions were about going from climb to climb to climb to climb, trying my absolute best. I didn't really judge myself on those climbs. I was just like, all right, whatever, sequence and like do my best. I'd have a rip and be like, all right, objectively, how was that? Like, why was it good? Why was it bad? And a lot of the time, the things I would correct were not low-hanging fruits. They were just decisions that I was making poorly. Then I went into the kind of realm of performance, and it's what we've been podcasting about a lot. It's like, well, you can just perform better. Like, yeah, you could train to get yourself more ready for this type of thing, but there's a thing about choices and decisions and the things that you do know or the things that you rely on that kind of happen go to go. And I found that low-hanging fruits are a little bit more decision-based, a little bit more thought process-based than it is training-based. That's a long-term thing, right? But of course, you're going to find micro edges like that or like well you just have lower back core issues or something you can't get your feet up all the time like those are the things that you train those are the things that you kind of find over time but well, when you have just the one session or two you can look for well those. And again we're talking about prioritizing we're talking about what what do you you have finite resources so what do you focus on and we've you know harped for the last hour about how do the thing that you want to do climb Climb, climb, you know, climbing is the thing. Uh, but then maybe you don't have enough time even to go climbing. And maybe you think that now is the time for a training session. And first of all, I, I want you to think twice about that because if you have time to train, you probably have time to climb. You, you really do. Uh, so, yeah, 100%. So then it's like, okay, well, I have all these things I need to work on. What can I work on off the wall? And you know, again, I, I, I told you it's, it's micro edges for me, but I have, a, I have a lot of things I could work on, but for me, that's the thing. And when I show up to hangboard, I just do that thing because I don't have a lot of time to, I would love to, you know, I can tell you the other things I'm not so good. I, I, I actually would really love to get better on uh two, two finger uh, open hand pockets because I kind of have like a tweak or I had a tweak a long time ago that really feels better when I spend some time on it. It'd be nice to really cement that grip so that I know I, I'm unlikely to hurt it again. Uh, yeah, one arm hangs on edges are really good for me too. I just, I just can't do it all. So knowing what it is and uh, fitting that in is really important. And the way I also think about fitting it in is, again, you have maybe two or three sessions a week where you're really focusing on climbing. Oftentimes, you know, now you're in the groove. Now you're warmed up. Now could be the time where you fit in that low-hanging fruit drill. So uh, I, I've been doing this where before I climb, I will do the uh, you know, max effort on a minimum edge. So uh, it's, you know, I do my finger training in a very small way right before climbing. And I think I got that from Ned Feely, the, the beast maker guy, where 
I'll just warm up and I'll do a max hang on micro edge and I'll do my moonboard session, wherever the case may be. Uh, maybe it's endurance for you. And so at the very end, you do a four by four. Uh, you know, maybe you need to work on leg power and it's pistols at the very end when you're really warmed up and feeling good. Sometimes it's actually a better use of time. You know, I, I don't love the, the hero sessions where you climb two or three times a week and they're massive, but sometimes that's all you got, you know? Like, uh, you yeah, know, let's just, let's just be on, honest. Uh, and it's not about trying to fit everything in there. It's about trying to fit the main thing in there. And then maybe you have time for one other thing. And uh, so really think hard about your, what, if, if you could only pick one exercise off the wall, what would it be? And honestly, for, for most people, 90, 90, 90 times out of 100, nine times out of 10 is the, the better fraction, it's probably just climb more, you know? It, it really is. Um, we did a whole podcast and I'm not gonna say anything. Yeah, there's movement theory, yeah. you know, like getting, do you know how to do a move the best way? That That is probably the number one thing that most people can work on daily. And it's actually something that I work on daily. I love what you were just saying right there. Like, that's actually the reason why I broke up the the three North Stars thing from like the one week, the one month and the one year. The one week thing is just the thing you should be focusing on the most. You know, and for you, the one month thing is like those two finger open hand pockets or like one, you know, one arm hangs that maybe you'll just litter in a little bit throughout your session. Maybe you'll find climbs two or three tries in that day that, you know, have a little bit of that aspect. And then even a more broader concept than that is still important to have in your sessions. But that was a lot. It's so funny that you and I do approach these things a little bit differently because we have different constraints. Um, I got one more um, for you guys. It's a little bit shorter. Um, but yeah, I got the pick three North Stars, try to focus on trying hard. Uh, I love this discussion so far. And the last note that I have is have fun. Man, I, I think this one gets really uh, lost. Uh, don't get too caught up in the overall gains. You know, like, yeah, we're talking about how to overall gain more, of course. But if if that's the focus, if that's like, it's, I think this is a really like hard thing to get into people's heads. Um, and it helps to have the kid mentality, like, you know, where, dude, what's the most important thing you're, first day of climbing, your first week of climbing, your first month of climbing, there's like nothing else that matters to you. You, you, you're so excited. You drive to the gym, you get your day pass, you get your month membership and you put your shoes on. You're like, ah, I got the challenges today. I got that one V2 thing that I fell the last move a bunch of times. Like think about, think about literally the word so choices sad. that are in your head, your first days climb. Like, you know, when you're a kid, like and yeah, even though you're 30 years old, 40 years old, your first time climbing, you're still a kid, dude. Like you, you still walk into the gym, you're still a kid. And that kid mentality is really important to have. This is your chance to live more in the moment and more in each session. There's a huge difference between thinking about your gains and just doing the gains, right? Like if you can have this kid mentality and gain five or 10% in the little habits that we're talking about and the little movement theory things that we're talking about and the little choices that we're talking about, but really the most thing that you're trying to focus on is having fun and just like, ah, oh, let's just, you know, go from boulder to boulder, let's pick different styles and let's just actually focus on trying our absolute best and having fun with that too, falling and having fun, like making fun of it. Man, I, I can't, I can't like session in the gyms. I can't really stand it anymore. You know, like not that many people are having that much, that much fun. You know, people talk a little about the, nu the nuances of like going from gym to gym to gym. The real difference that I see is people sessioning, man. Like the real difference is the allowance of fun. That's a huge one. Let people have more fun, guys. Like fist bump each other, cheer people on, like laugh when people make mistakes. Like when you make a mistake, laugh about it. It's not the end of the world, dog. Like your foot slip, it's fine. Like you'll figure it out your next try. Like you know, people get mad at me also when I laugh when people fall and I'm like, I'll stop and be like, wait, wait, wait. Why, why are we beefing right now? Oh, I'm having fun. You're having fun. Like we're all having fun, right? And I think like, man, I used to get comments all the time. Like even in, people would say this to me all the time. Like, Tim, like it's crazy. Even in competitions, you're smiling after you fall. I'm like competition or not, I'm climbing. I'm having fun. You know, if I can't do that, I might as well not go to the gym. That's what I was saying before. If I, if I, the F effort, the psych for me is hard to have, I might as well not go and climb, dude. Because if it's not a fun session, it's not a good session. If it's not a good session, I'm not getting better. You know, and like, yeah, I'm addicted to getting better, but really I'm addicted to having fun. That's, yeah. the, that's the thing that is the most important thing for me. Yeah, I love that. And that's what Nathaniel was saying about the power of the psych. And, and that's what I'm saying where <laughs> don't do a hangboard session during a Zoom call. You're, you're not, if you're not going to show up, it, it's, 
not only is it not worth it, it's like not fun, right? Like you're just fitting it in. Um, and so, I, you know, I want to just get really practical and also share what I do to fit it all in uh, because, you know, there is just an element of, you know, what, what do you actually do? And uh, I mean, first thing is you got to sacrifice other things, you know, turn off Netflix, turn off Call of Duty, you turn off this pod, um, you know, do the, do the damn thing, actually climb. And uh, when we think about prioritizing and the reason why we emphasize the climbing itself and the technical aspect and the mental aspect is because you always look for these, these dominoes, the, these, these big things that make everything else happen. So uh, I can do a one-arm pull. I don't know if I can do a one-arm pull right now. Let's just say I can do a one-arm pull-up. Do I ever train one-arm pull-ups? No, I did not do a one-arm pull-up because I tried to do one-arm pull-ups. I got there because of climbing. So, you know, if you train a one-arm pull-up, did you get better at climbing? Probably not. You got stronger. Uh, if you got better at climbing, you probably got stronger as a result also, and now you can do the one-arm pull-up. So this is where this recommendation of focusing on the thing itself is so important because it typically will solve whatever problem you have. And then uh, if it's not, like uh, yeah, you find you do have some kind of issue, that's your priority number two. That's your, your low-hanging fruit. You know, here I am just loving the results I have on hangboard on minimum edges. It's because for me, I, I don't get the stimulation I need on little edges at this time to progress on them. So now it's my priority number two. And the thing is, is that it, you, know, you might hear this and say like, oh, Josh, I got priority number two. And then there's priority number three, four, five, and six. And I would argue that almost for no one, do you have any kind of willpower or time to really climb and get that volume in climbing and focusing there and work anything more than one other weakness? Maybe you're a professional athlete. Maybe you have a coach that's walking you through every, uh, you know, every little thing you need to do and making sure that you're checking all the boxes while you're off the wall. But honestly, I found lots of success from just diving into the climbing, and then training comes second. And I used to say, you have to earn the training. You have to be climbing so much that you find something that you actually need to train off the wall, and then you do it. Um, so, yeah, you know, again, that's how you got to set uh, your thought process. And I would encourage you to, to have a home gym if you're really uh, struggling for time. And that sounds great. You're like, Josh, I don't have... I don't have the time or I don't have the, the, the place to, to do that. And really having a hangboard over a door frame is, is a big deal. Like, you know, you can do pull-ups on there. You can, you can kind of campus even between holds a little bit, uh, especially if you put two, uh, you know, people often do it kind of in a corner between two, uh, two door frames. So you can kind of campus between them. Uh, you can do all sorts of pull-ups, whatever the case may be, make sure that you, are serious about that place and that you don't put it in front of the TV or you turn off the TV, you put in the headphones and you show up for that moment. Uh, and again, that's just really, you know, sharing how I do it, which is where I have consistent sessions with friends. So I have that social accountability and I take those sessions extremely seriously. Or when it comes to the moonboard, I'm by myself. I have a very clear goal. I want to do all the freaking moonboard problems, and so there's no doubt about finding that that limit, right? You know, I, I'm showing up to do the hard thing at the moment, and I talked about how I might fit in some of my other, but or my my other priority in that uh, session itself. Sometimes it's outside of the session if it has to be, I uh, and you know I walk every morning to get my steps in. I wake up early to do that. Uh, you know, to, to me, that's like foundational, you know, making time to, to eat well. Uh, but in some ways, anything else is just extra and fluff that I'm, I'm lucky, right? I, I, I have my morning walk. I have about, I actually try to do some sort of climbing or training every single day of the week, but I, in reality, only happens about three or four times. I block it out on my calendar. 
I, I put an hour and a half in the middle of the day, but sometimes something comes up. And then if that doesn't happen after dinner, when the kids are asleep, I, I show up then and I sneak in some kind of low intensity, you know, right after my kids fall asleep. But nine times out of 10, I, I don't do that because I'm just too tired from the end of the day. But I have those sessions with friends also that keep me accountable where I show up and try really, really hard and they're very serious. And I take, you know, I make sure to sleep well and not drink the night before that, right? Like I, I'm, I'm there to perform. But it's just, that's the thing that gets you better, man. Yeah, I love that. I won't go to, I won't go into like my practical approach necessarily. It's not that different. Like in the day to day, I don't walk and stuff like that, but you know, you Josh should, is dude. old man. That's no, sorry, dude, sorry. no, you I'm, should. I'm it's no, ah. it's, it's important, man. I, 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 one of my biggest life changing things in the past year has been waking up at dawn and going for an hour walk. Really? I, I just, no one's wow. going to do that. That's you walk for an hour, this, like, like 45 minutes or an hour. I like wake up at dawn and just go out. I listen to podcasts. I do a lot of research for our guests, like any guest that's been on podcasts before i listen to those and uh yeah I, it helps you sleep that's bad really good for you keeps you lean uh there's a there's a pro tip for you that's pretty awesome that's really cool uh one thing to add to that i mean yeah maybe maybe that should be implemented um real talk but you know one thing that uh i maybe should have mentioned earlier that i'll do i still regularly session two or three times a week I, i'm still not even like uh, very regular in my sessions. I'm trying to reframe my life into a place where I can climb more consistently because it does matter to me and I want to make those sacrifices. But lately, a lot of the things that I do on my off days is actually a lot of body care. So I'm not, I don't stretch that often for the sake of gaining flexibility or gaining mobility. I actually stretch for the relaxing part of it because my body is just so tense all the time. Like after a hard training session, I cannot tell you all the, the knots and the tweaks and the twists that I have in my body that will not relax. You can force your body to relax. And that actually takes a lot of work. It you can a ton of time. force your body to relax. <laughs> you can force your body to relax. That's what you're doing when you're getting chiropractic work, acupuncture, trigger point therapy, massage therapy, like stretching. Like that's what you're doing. You're forcing your body to relax. Your body isn't very smart. You know, like it, it does it, it does it what you tell it to do. It's not necessarily going to relax immediately. There are things that can help. Not having alcohol, that's a great, that's a great way to kind of induce your body to a, a better healthy place to recover but general recovery will tell you that you know circulation is what you want but also i do a ton of trigger point therapy that is a whole realm that's being you know looked into now for climbing and whatnot and i try not to spray people on it but man i do it every day every am i i'm touching my forearms i'm touching my tendons i'm touching everything that i'm looking for places that have knots and stuff so uh, something practical that i definitely do all of the time is i focus on recovery uh, because it's one thing to get a lot out of your sessions, but it's another thing to go into your session feeling loose and like feeling actually flexible and like being like, all right, dope. Like, even though I'm tired, like my body's ready. Like, because I have a lot of sessions where growing up, I would uh, get a lot of extensor uh, tweaks, like a lot on the top of my forearm, a lot of like my flexors would get really tight. And I would literally just start my session and be like, dude, I can't crimp. Like a lot of the crimps that I feel like I didn't even do anything necessarily. I just never relaxed. I think this was the one thing. And a lot of my sessions nowadays, I feel very relaxed going into them. Uh, so maybe invest in some mobility, some flexibility training, some, you know, recovery, some massage therapy and whatnot. Go buy some, acu like if I had the money, dude, I would go see an acupuncture or a, ther a chiropractor therapist like all the time. Like if I had infinite money for that type of stuff, like don't tell me you wouldn't, you know, like, uh, of course, I would love having somebody just be like, yeah, yeah, let's just relax everything. Let's just see it. You know, like, of course, I would. I, I bet is an old man perk. Uh, I do see uh, you know, a chiro or nice. like a body worker. Uh, pretty darn often. And I, I, I think that some of that mobility work, some of the, um, I guess actually it is interesting to hear you say focus on recovery because while uh, that does take time, um, it, you know, it can really help with that energy and psych and some of that uh, trigger point therapy or that mobility work, which uh, you know, I've, I think I've said on here that uh, I'm a big fan of Kelly Starrett, the ready state becoming a simple leopard. And some of the, the work that's been done on that is that's really good at switching you into a relaxed state. So uh, putting time into it at night in front of the TV, just to really let yourself, you know, sleep better. Uh, so, you know, uh, fitting, you know, another thing to fit in, but uh, I will just, I will repeat again that you guys know, 
do do the damn thing and, and do it and sacrifice do the damn sacrifice thing. everything around to make those times special you know there there's this uh trend i think where i've seen this where people say you know it's not about performing all the time you know if i just saw some instagram posts i can't remember who posted this but uh you know climber uh, a runner doesn't run 100 meter every day at, at max effort uh and i think that running is very different than, than climbing and i think that it does a huge disservice to tell people that if they're going to go into the gym two or three times a week they need to show up and freaking perform they need to do their best they need to try their hardest they need to try hard if they feel wrecked maybe it's not the time to get on the crimpiest thing ever that your fingers are already achy that's not what i'm saying but you need to show up and take it seriously very seriously and i guarantee you you will have better results by showing up those three times and prioritizing them getting the sleep getting the rest having the psych and you will end up doing that one arm pull up you will do whatever the thing is that you want to do on the side just by showing up and taking it seriously and that's my soapbox that's all i got tim nice yeah guys try hard all the time you know do your best like really take some time you know before your sessions during your sessions after your sessions try to make an agreement with what your best actually is don't judge yourselves too harshly have fun you know like that that's something that i'll, I'll coach at every single level of climbing every single level of climbing to remind people like are you having fun like are you judging yourself too harshly because if you're judging yourself too harshly you're using information to tell yourself why you're not good enough versus using information to see where you should be is a huge difference in that approach, right? To degrade yourself and saying, I'm not good enough because I'm not doing these things versus, well, if I want to be good, I have to do these things. You're kind of saying the same thing, but they're completely different approaches. Don't judge yourselves, guys. Try your best all the time. And yeah, hopefully things were helpful from this podcast and hopefully you guys grow. Well, and the thing that really stood out to me that you talked about that I, I want to emphasize again as we close out is you said that you had time to fit in other things, but that took away from your ability to show up and do the damn thing. You could have done more hangboard. You could have done whatever. And don't be fooled into thinking that checking those boxes means you'll become a better climber because at the end of the day, that North Star is getting better at climbing, not getting better at training. So don't just shove in exercises and time thinking that that's the key to your success. It rarely is. All right, Tim, my priority is to go uh go make a sandwich i'll take it easy dude i'm out all right see ya thanks for tuning in if you'd like to learn more about test piece climbing you can check us out at testpiececlimbing.com and even book a session with one of our coaches